today we'll be talking about Chapter 7, which is about where you place the highest activities in the organization. But in addition, I'm going to go through a couple of um, examples. And then there's uh, one that's in this uh, list of extra materials about Owen and Minor, case example. And then there's another one that I found in my set of notes about uh, Norbis group then. But <coughs> because um, it's not my material, like I can't just record it here. So I'm only going to record the first half of the lecture, and then the second half is you just have to access the materials yourself. So. <coughs> um, yeah. So uh, this chapter wants you to talk about like whether you should uh, locate things centrally or distributed or decentralized, and um, whether or not you should choose to outsource certain activities, and how you should charge for these activities, and what type of staff, staff you need. Um, the centralized model is, um, <coughs> this is the figure that, um, well, this isn't the same. This is figure 7-2 in the book. And, oh no, 7-1, here we go. 7-1 uh, on page 184. And this is if you have uh, one uh, IS department uh, with computer and software and everything. And um, so all questions throughout the organization are directed to the one department. So <coughs> that would be considered a very centralized approach. Uh, so the triangle is like the IS, and that's um, in one specific IS department. Uh, the next model is a, um, a centralized approach where you have, again, the IS is in one department, but it's meant to serve like uh, all of the other departments. And the, the advantage of this approach is that uh, you have a corporate focus that um, uh, it supports systems integration so that everyone is using the same system. And then um, it also it supports accessibility and centralized expertise. So these are the advantages. Uh, the disadvantage of this would be it could be inflexible and it can bring some of the IS services uh, <coughs> remote from the business uh, units. So these are the business units, and these are the IS operations, and some of this may be remote from some of the business units. This would be an approach that might be, for example, if this was ERP system that's used across the organization, and, um, and all of the sub-departments have to make use of the same integrated system. And as we talked about the ERP systems before, this, this can be considered an <coughs> inflexible approach. Uh, the other extreme is <coughs> decentralization, where you have um, kind of a repeated infrastructure in different departments. And so you lose this integration, and you have a <coughs> kind of a duplication of some of the resources have duplication of human resources and physical resources that need to <coughs> support each of the, the departments. <coughs> However, you can get some more uh, flexibility in terms of local ownership and um, being able to support the activities that each department <coughs> needs. <coughs> uh, the example for the uh, centralized approach was Gosin, and that was on... Um, page 184, in, and um, oh no, <coughs> it was on the top of page 185, Gosen, and that's a uh, gas transporter. And the example of the decentralized approach is Unilever, and that's at the bottom of page 185, and this is a healthcare provider. And then they say they have the business units only have to agree on harmonizing reporting and structuring at the top level. So they have all kinds of um, 
<coughs> IS applications and infrastructures repeated at the local business level. Okay. So the arguments for whether or not you could have a centralized or decentralized approach, um, the centralized approach is the emphasis on um, database and systems maintenance. New systems uh, must be compatible with existing ones. Requests for service <coughs> sounds uh, justification and tangible benefits. But <coughs> some of these um, arguments for <coughs> the emphasis on the database <coughs> and system maintenance is um, now can also be handled in decentralized approaches. So when we talk about web services and cloud computing, and uh, when we go to the example of Owen and Miner, they would talk about how they maintain their data in a decentralized way. So before where it was traditionally done as a centralized approach, more and more so it's been done in a decentralized way. Um, <coughs> and uh, so we're seeing more and more an emphasis in businesses towards a decentralized approach. Uh, some of the functions, but as we, we will talk about later on, some of the functions, it depends what functions you're talking about, like maybe management of standards might be done centrally, whereas user applications may be done decentrally. So we have um, <coughs> emphasis on user needs and problems, growth of new systems, multiple and frequency change suppliers, lack of standardization and control. These are some of the, <coughs> the dominant features of decentralized approach. And that's uh, table 7, 1 on page 186. Okay. The next model is sort of a, uh, they call this distributed. And um, probably this is why I'm saying we have more of a decentralized approach, but they call it in this book, they call it uh, distributed or federated model. And that means that there is some of the functions that are done centrally, and then some of them are repeated and done uh, by separate divisions. So you might have, for example, uh, hardware and databases in a centralized area or centralized control, uh, standards are centralized, and various infrastructure elements are centralized. So a lot of emphasis on structured uh, standardized control of a centralized infrastructure is infrastructure that's common to everyone across the organization. And then at local level, you might have specifications and administration of applications. So you might have applications uh, with, within certain guidelines. So the applications can be designed locally, but they have to be within the centralized uh, guidelines or centralized standards. And an example of this is um, a hold on page 186. It says, a hold is a retailer with headquarters in the Netherlands operates four retail formulas, head office uh, has an IS unit, and maintains strict guidelines required to enterprise applications. And then within each retail formula, um, within each country, managers can develop unique applications. So this is an example of centralized guidelines and local applications. Okay, um, <coughs> before we talk about the, the resource pool, um, the book seems to uh, go over uh, one of the models by Weil and Ross 2005. And this talks about the information um, management uh, hierarchy or um, the center of control. <coughs> so I'm just going to just briefly call this. Um, they have something at the, they have like a, a triangle. And at the top there's something here. I'll call that E. And here you have C. And here you have C. Anarchy. B is feudalism. 
anti-monarchy or um, up, <coughs> they call it anti-monarchy or technocratic utopian. So I'll put technocratic utopian. And then E is uh, business monarchy. And um, these are um, different types of, it says uh, you can position different IS activities in the IS decision making from a political point of view. And these are the different political um, points of um, views or, dis or um, these are different approaches. And it says that IS uh, governance can uh, be made over different decision domains. So if we have we have uh, several decision. This is I S or I T governance, and we have decision domains. We have principles. Architecture, infrastructure, and strategies. Business application needs. So these are different areas that can be governed either centrally or decentrally. So these are different uh, areas that you have to make decisions about. If the company has some certain grounding principles, they have to make decisions about this. If they have certain architecture, IT architecture issues, they have to make decisions about this. And I think the infrastructure strategies and business applications and, and investments. So these are all separate areas that need to be made decisions about. And um, according to this, uh, you can uh, do this either uh, centrally or decentrally. So these are two uh, centralized approaches. And these are two um, <coughs> rather <coughs> yeah. so D and B and E are centralized, rather centralized or concentrated approaches, and these are um, decentralized. <coughs> so if this triangle <coughs> or pyramid is the organization, uh, so in the anarchy, uh, there is no one way of doing things. Different decisions are made in different parts across the organization. But um, in the uh, in the feudal approach, also uh, very much decentralized, and in the uh, feudalism also somewhat decentralized. But then these other um, two, the technocratic utopian and business monarchy, uh, very centralized. And they describe what are these uh, meanings like. <coughs> the technological utopian is a heavy technological approach to information management, stresses categorization and modeling of the organization. This approach will often lead to centralism of IT activities where IT experts are the most powerful. So here it's the IT experts. These are the ones making the decisions. And the monarchy has the firm leaders 
define information categories um, and reporting structures. A centralized model with senior management in charge rather than the IT experts. So these are like the CEOs or CIOs. That's actually CIOs as CEOs. CIOs as CIOs. And then uh, feudalism, the management of the information uh, by individual units or functions, uh, which define their own information needs and report back. This is quite close to a federal model with emphasis on decentralization. So, so this is uh, kind of a, a focus on, um, on business units. can be spread across organizations. In federalism approach um, to information management based on consensus and negotiation on the organization's key information elements and reporting structure. So this is um, based on a negotiation process across the organization. And then the anarchy is the absence of any overall information management policy, leaving individuals to use and user departments to obtain and manage their own information. So this is largely individuals deciding. Okay. okay. So, um, on the next page, there's an example, and it's in uh, Table 7-2. They show uh, different governance archetypes, which is these. These are the, the governance archetypes. And then you have the different IT governance domains, which is these. So if we had a table with A, B, C, D, E, and we had the different domains are 1, 2, 3, or 5, you might have an organization that follows different uh, different types of governance for different areas of decision making. So that's the point. So if we looked at, for example, um, the college, multi-college, we can try to place this in this type of a hierarchy. So if we look at the, and we're talking about the information systems governance, we're not talking about the whole college. and everything it does, but it's information systems governance. So in terms of the principles, um, how is that uh, determined? Which type of governance structure is used? Um, I think of this as more like um, kind of in the vision statement. So if the college has a vision statement about how it's going to use its, um, um, you know, information technology for a strategic advantage, in that terms. I think this comes basically maybe from the board very centralized structure. So I would say it's more of this E structure. So I would put it there. Because it's not the IT department, the IT center that decides on that. 
um, the architecture. Um, that might be the IT experts, the architect. Because this is more like um, what type of telephone system are you going to use? And uh, even if the top department makes dis purchasing decisions, I think that the IS department will make recommendations and probably be <coughs> follow them. Like what kind of <coughs> what kind of uh, network we use and like, for like for example, the the, tele the front telephone network, and then the um, the green door. I'm gonna just say it's D. <coughs> <coughs> And then the uh, infrastructure, um, telephone, and Eudora. It's not using Eudora. What is it called? This um, Edgerum. Edgerum. Sorry. Edgerum. <laughs> um, just the, um, the basic architecture of how they're going to use it. Technology, and then the infrastructure strategies. Um, yeah, like um, which rooms have video conferencing systems set up? <laughs> uh, it could be like more than one area, although they don't seem to have. Yeah, they have some. Some in this example, they have some that are in multiple areas. So the infrastructure activities, I would say, um, it could be both. Um, oh wait, I should be doing it this way. <laughs> uh, C is business units and D. So it could be both, I think, because some infrastructure Decisions are made by the experts, and some are made uh, by the groups that are using it. So this um, team of the it's the it's the research group that is kind of, or the, the project group that is deciding where the infrastructure should go. For now, and then. Um, Let's see. Uh, business application needs and um, I'm not really sure about this one. Um, it's there's probably some negotiation. So, like, what kind of tools do I need on my desktop? Some of it's decided centrally, some of it is decided <coughs> by my request. And um, yeah, so then maybe the, de <coughs> the department. So um, could be, and maybe like even some individualism, but I don't think it's an IT. <coughs> and then IT investments. Um, This IT investments is also probably largely central, but maybe has some influence from the experts. So I think of um, I think of uh, this as the as like the board or the top and the, the leaders. And then uh, this 
this here. IT department. And I think of this as all of the, uh, the, the departments like OES and, and, and health. And um, um, and there may be like uh, further uh, research groups or something. And then individuals. So just to try to map, it doesn't mean it has to be that way with all the organizations, but just to try to map what, how I think it is at the college. <coughs> um, you should maybe try to think of another organization and how it might map and how they decide to map their functions. Okay. Um, but it's like... Um, uh, there's other options besides centralized, decentralized, distributed. And uh, what is becoming more common is to create a resource pool, which is like another unit uh, that can provide ITIS services to other parts of the organization. And uh, the example is given on page 190, uh, the <coughs> Akimia. Is in a Dutch insurance company, and they produce. Um, uh, they do work for the other business unit in the organization, and um, so the other business units can purchase uh, services from the Akimia Active uh, Resource Pool. So this one is called Akimia Active. And these are different business units. And these are local resources. And uh, they can um, choose to also purchase resources from, that are provided by this Akemia. Um, usually, this uh, is done through a service level agreement. And the service level agreement has uh, different conditions, like how much does it cost, what type of um, service is being provided within what period of time, and so forth. Um, but the question for organizations may be is, uh, does the business unit have to purchase from the <coughs> resource uh, um, pool, or can they purchase from somebody outside the organization? And uh, can the resource pool also sell to other service, <coughs> to other organizations? So it depends how separate it is as a unit and whether or not the other organizations have to uh, purchase from them. And when I talk about Norgis Group, this is an example of, of that. So I'll talk about that after. <coughs> okay, so having a special unit to provide IT services and hiring it out is an option. And then <coughs> if we look at it even further, you can think of this uh, resource unit as um, you, know, you could get resources from outside of the, um, the organization as well. So we had here the resource unit was somebody internal to the organization that you could hire to do your services. Mm -hmm. But you can also hire from outside your organization. Um, organizations have to decide which uh, functions to outsource to get from the outside. And usually they don't want to outsource things that are part of their core business. But they will choose to outsource um, maybe standardized services like accounting or something like that uh, doesn't distinguish them as a business. Uh, there's different types of outsourcing. I just uh, remove this. So you can outsource, and that's when you 
have business functions that are outside, we get them from outside the organization. Then you can have offshoring. And that means you transfer the IS functions to another country. It could be still part of the same organization, but the the uh, IT functions are in a different physical country. And you have multi-sourcing. different companies are supplying different parts of the IS client. Or services. Okay. Uh, but they're all different types of outsourcing, basically. Um, so the advantages of uh, outsourcing is that you have access to known to know-how and consulting. That means you can keep up more easily with technological changes. And you have low uh, personal and fixed costs. So that means you, you probably need to hire fewer people to be in-house to manage your IT. And then you have greater attention to the core business <coughs> functions, and uh, you, because you're out, you're not outsourcing the core business functions. And then the other advantages that they <coughs> don't list are that it um, creates legally binding contracts that ensures quality standards. So it helps to ensure the quality. It helps to achieve um, change that you cannot do by yourself. And it also <coughs> uh, helps to achieve faster development of products. And um, <coughs> it helps to standardize the business processes. So it's about standardization and increasing quality and enabling the company to do things they couldn't normally do themselves unless they hired the expertise. Uh, the risk of outsourcing is that you might lose some control on uh, you, and you have to be careful to not lose control of important data or important functions. And you have to make sure that um, you, uh, you don't become dependent on maybe one provider that you can uh, that you have the ability to choose among providers so that there's some sort of um, quality assurance. And uh, you might lose the in-house expertise, and you might have to pay too much for a service. So you need to make sure you get a good service. Um, this uh, last city asked questions about outsourcing. And then in addition to the questions that are here, it's, so he says, what are, are the systems uh, not strategic? And this again points to you don't want to outsource your core functions. You only want to outsource the ones that are not strategic. Um, are we certain that our IS requirements will not change? So um, even if the system is a commodity, can it be broken off? What he does in this here is that uh, what is what in-house staff do we need to negotiate strong contracts uh, to ensure we get the most out of our contracts? and to enable us to exploit change. So 
these are the additional points that are mentioned on page 193. The book doesn't have uh, <coughs> everything listed on the uh, outsourcing, so I can point out that on page uh, 195, they talk about uh, the issues of IS governance in the bullet points. So IS outsourcing, outsourcing governance includes, for example, quality measurement and management, uh, preparation and management of change, and so forth. So you can find the what are the, re the governance requirements for outsourcing on page 195. On page 196 in table 7.3, um, there is a comparison of uh, the impact on the core operations and IT impact on the core strategy. And so it should show that um, for example, if the impact on the core operations is slow and the impact on the core strategy is slow, then it says support-oriented information resources management. Outsourcing presumption is yes. Reasons to consider outsourcing access to higher IT professionalism. So like the, the risks are low <coughs> if this, uh, these two questions are, or these two factors are low. But if the risk is uh, high and high, then um, uh, outsourcing presumptions is mixed. So you may not um, choose to do outsourcing. And then the reasons to outsource you should consider are to rescue out of control IT unit, cap source of cash, facilities cost, take cost flexibility. So different reasons why you might do it but it's not certain. And so for both of the impact on core strategy, the choice for outsourcing is mixed. And for the ones when it's, when it's low, uh, then it's uh, usually yes. And the IT impact on core operations, this is, this is more like the IT functions. If it's going to improve that, uh, then you probably should do it as long as the there's no impact on the strategy. Um, one uh, reason for outsourcing, and again, this goes back to this uh, type of model of having a special unit to supply IS resources and outsourcing, is that you can have different types of cost models. Let me just write the cost models down. On page 198, you have uh, how to charge charge. For IS. So you have a service center. And for the most part, uh, the service center is that the services are free. So you have a unit that provides the services for free. You might have a cost center. <coughs> and the cost center means that um, uh, maybe the user is unaware of this, but there's some sort of charging at cost. So the organization is aware of the cost of each of the services. You could have a profit center. And the profit center is the IT center is a business unit, and it can charge market uh, prices. So the IT center is a business unit, and it can charge market prices. Of 
services. And then you have a hybrid center. Um, so some services might be subsidized. And an example of this is if uh, maybe some infrastructural services are necessary for the organization, and they want everyone to have it. Uh, so they... <coughs> It doesn't matter if it costs more in one location and it's less in another. They're not going to charge people how much they cost, but they're going to just provide that service. And then other services, maybe like consulting or uh, different types of software support that's not necessarily part of the core <coughs> offerings might be charged at a profit. So you have some things that are just supplied as uh, part of the center services, maybe the free services or the cost, and then you might have others that are charged. And these are probably subsidized by, if they make more money here, it goes towards covering the unbalanced cost on the different parts of the units or in the organization. Okay, on the page 199, there's a table 7-4, and this points towards the advantages and disadvantages of each of the different types of cost models. So you can look at the advantages and disadvantages of that. Okay, um, okay so... Um, as this next part talks about four ways to control IS activities. So you, have, you can do it as a general management, uh, users, or IS management. And um, the problem is they're, they're talking about the uh, why the IS activities control or the management fails. And it says that uh, in the general management area, you must have uh, communication and put things on the agenda so that the people, users and the IS management know what's going on. And that the users and the IS management also, uh, sometimes you need to have education. So there needs to be some, there's usually some kind of either communication or education problems between each of the units. So they talk about why is it that there's a failure from each of the perspectives. Like each of the, the general managers seems to seem, see something wrong with the users and see something wrong with the IS staff. And then the IS staff sees something wrong with the users and the general management. And the reason is <coughs> they each have their reasons, but um, <coughs> like the general managers, they say no clear business plan is available. So this would be why they fail. Inability to about strategic uses of IS. So these are the, the weaknesses of each of these different groups. And a lot of times it has to <coughs> do with uh, communication, like no clear business plan. You need to communicate the business plan. Um, uh, failure to communicate. And then other areas of the problem with education, lack of understanding, lack of appreciation. Um, yeah, failure and this so like failure to um, spot the IS strategic uses. So it's more like the lack of knowledge or lack of education. So the <coughs> this is on uh, page two hundred. And um, so we talk about how do you uh, manage IS or IT projects. And uh, they say that um, IT projects have like the target outcomes and solutions and approaches, and organizational change programs have outcomes and solutions and approaches. But the, the best approach is to have both, and so there should be a move towards the center. They need to have target outcomes that 
take into consideration both the IT and the organization solutions that take into consideration both the IT and the use of IT within the organization in the context. And the approach to change should consider integration with the uh, IT, with the culture. So the idea is that both of these should come together and that this is the ideal uh, solution to IT and organizational change. Um, this is about uh, different uh, organizational uh, activities <coughs> within the um, how you how to place things within the organization, and they have like the IS strategy and IS management is at the top, and then you have operations. Uh, maybe you do things like putting in data and maintaining the the networks, uh, purchasing. Getting uh, the software and then user education and user support. And so, this is mostly about developability and reliability. Uh, this is about purchasing and this is about education. And sometimes in small organizations, to have this level of services is actually supplied as supplied by one department or one person or a couple people. So yet you have people that are doing all of these things and maybe it's not so it's not so uh, triangular but it's more like you have the top management deciding <coughs> strategy and management and then you have IT support doing everything else in terms of operations, uh, purchasing and support. It depends how big the organization is. Um, we're to the last slide, so I'm just pushing on a bit more. Um, we have um, a, a model for IT governance, and this model is called um, Corbit. It's on page uh, 204, <coughs> or 205, and 204 and 205, and it's a... Um, control objectives for information and related technology. And the idea is that it's um, including um, its assessment standards so that you have um, measures and indicators of IT governance. So the first stage is to plan. Uh, you plan the use of IT to reach goals. The second stage is acquire. You identify requirements of the IT, and usually this is done, <coughs> includes a maintenance plan. The third stage is uh, deliver and support. So you execute the IS system applications, and this usually includes education and training. And then the fourth stage is monitor and evaluate. And the, you ask, does the IS system meet the objectives? And at this stage, you do controlling, and uh, you change where it needs, where you identify the need to change. And then you also ask, does the IT meet the business objectives, uh, both internally and externally? So the idea is that the Corbett model makes use of measures and indicators uh, to see, um, to evaluate. Uh, and maybe best practices to evaluate IT governance. So again, um, usually <coughs> here there's a business plan, and here there's a maintenance plan, and here there's uh, education and training, and here there's monitoring and control, and um, asking if you've met your business objectives. Um, one more thing is <coughs> there's a group called uh, ITGI and um, that's on page 204 um, it's um, I can't remember what this 
IT governance uh, definition. So the IT governance definition on page 204 says, the leadership and organization structures and processes that ensure that the operations, IT sustains and extends the organization's strategies and objectives. So the idea is that the, um, the structures and processes of the, of the organization should ensure that the organization reaches its strategies and objectives. And challenges of this uh, IT governance is that you need to align the IT strategy with the business strategy and that you have um, cascading uh, strategies and goals uh, down the enterprise. So that means that each uh, part of the organization from the top to the bottom might have different strategies and goals, but that they should all kind of support each other. So the strategies and goals of the business unit should also uh, support the strategies and goals of the overall organization. And then uh, you need to provide organizational structure uh, to implement the strategies and goals. And you need to insist on the IT control uh, framework that is adopted and implemented. And you need to measure performance. So this is, again, what the corporate model is supposed to ensure. So like the Corbett sort of an assessment. Oh. And you have this IT GI definition that's on uh, page 204. And uh, the structures and processes have to support the strategies and objectives. align IS and business strategy to um, support cascading, uh, <laughs> cascading strategy and goals. Provide structure. To support the strategies and goals. Ensure that your framework is adopted and used. And you have to measure performance. And as we had here, we had this uh, 
Okay, we have one, two, three, four. And this was, uh, you have a plan to use the, to reach your goals. You have a maintenance plan. Here you have education and training. And you execute the applications. And here you um, monitor control. don't meet your, con your objectives, you need to make changes. It's like sort of a circular. Okay. So, um, that's that. <coughs> okay, um, we went over. Uh, we can take ten minutes break, and when we come back, we'll go through some of the examples, but I won't be recording it. So, um, I think I'll go through this uh, Norgis group first, and then uh, we can <coughs> we can look at the videos on your own.